Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the first 100 days deciphering key provisions in the Buy American Act for government contractors. We can go to the next slide. My name is Jackie Unger, and I'm happy to be joined today by my colleague, Anna Sullivan. You can see there are little pictures of us. We can go on to the next slide. Anna and I both work in the government contracts group at Polaro Maza. Uh, this is one of several practice groups that we have, including labor and employment, business and transactions, and litigation and dispute resolution groups. Um, like many of the issues that we help our clients address, what we'll be discussing today has some level of crossover between many of the different practice groups that we have. Um, and before we really jump in, I just wanted to say that if you're interested in staying up to date on recent developments impacting government contractors, as well as just commercial businesses generally, you can sign up for our newsletters and our blogs at our website, polaromaza.com. Okay, moving on. So first we wanna give you an overview of what we're going to touch on today. We want to talk about the domestic preference laws and why you should care about them. Then we'll dive into the Buy American Act, uh, touching on an overview, its applicability, what the test is for determining the country of origin under the Buy American Act and exceptions that apply. Um, then we'll provide some recent updates on BAA. We've had some action at the beginning of the year this year, so we'll provide some explanation on that. Spend a little bit of time distinguishing the Trade Agreements Act and the requirements under TAA from BAA. Uh, then we'll provide some practical tips for ensuring compliance with BAA and TAA. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time left over where we can answer your questions. Um, you can provide those questions. There's a chat box where you can type in your questions. We can try to answer them as we go along um, or at the end. And if we aren't able to get to them today, then we'll make sure to uh, follow up via email with you. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anna to get us started with talking about the federal domestic preference laws. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. So just as a general overview, um, Federal domestic preference laws are just kind of a, it's a group of laws that show the federal government's longstanding preference for the purchase of domestic products over foreign products. And the Buy American Act of 1933, um, obviously we're going to be going into greater detail on this in later slides, but uh, just generally it provides preferential treatment for the purchase of domestic products and construction materials under federal government contracts. And the Trade Agreements Act of 1979, we'll also be diving into this more later, but it implements trade agreements guaranteeing non-discrimination of eligible foreign products while prohibiting the purchase of ineligible products and services. And then some other things, the Berry Amendment, this only applies to Department of Defense contracts, um, but it requires that certain DOD purchases, such as food, clothing, certain textiles and tools, and specialty metals be entirely grown or produced in the U.S. So the very amendment is a bit more restrictive than the BAA. And then we have Buy America, which is often referred to as Buy America Act, but this isn't a single unified statute or unified domestic preference program. Instead, the name is given for uh, domestic content restrictions that have been attached to funds that are provided to states, to local governments, and to third parties in the form of federal assistance. Uh, this generally covers transportation projects using DOT funding such as the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, um, and Amtrak, to name a few. Frederick, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so why should you care about these laws? Um, as we will explain in more detail in later slides, there are lingering impacts of the Trump administration through Trump's July 2019 executive order titled Maximizing Use of American-Made Goods, Products, and Materials. And there has been a renewed focus by President Biden as well following his January 25th executive order titled Ensuring the Future is Made in All of America by All of America's Workers. And we'll dive deeper into the impacts of both of these in later slides. I do Thanks. just want to note here that um, we have seen throughout Trump's administration 
that he did have a, a heavy focus. He put out a number of executive orders with an emphasis on um, improving or strengthening the Buy American Act requirements. Um, and, and there was also um, several pieces of legislation that were brought up didn't that I don't believe any of them have finally gone through, um, but that have been brought up from both sides with by uh, bipartisan support um, for strengthening the domestic content restrictions um, and trying to uh, tighten up on the waivers and exceptions to BAA that are used. And so now we're also seeing this renewed focus by Biden. So this is something that is not going away any time in the future. So important to stay on top of these restrictions and the changes that are made to them. All right, thanks, Jackie. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so compliance. Um, if you don't comply with these laws, there can be serious repercussions. Um, audits and investigations can be launched by GAO, by the agency, OIG, and DOJ, which could lead to false claims act exposure. And then there's potential suspension and debarment that can come from FCA exposure as well. Um, it's important also to remember that potential liability can extend to suppliers as well. And even if there's not an FCA claim, the government can terminate the contract and you could be left with re-procurement costs. Um, and as for post-award protests, if the offer doesn't comply with BAA or TAA, case law generally holds that an agency may rely on an offeror's certification of compliance. But if competitors have some evidence that you weren't complying with these, they might bring a protest saying that the agency didn't follow up on that as they were supposed to. Um, and just by way of example, in 2019, the owner and the business manager of Emerson Company, a DOD contractor, were each sentenced to prison for falsely certifying that the parts they were supplying to the DOD were BAA compliant in order to win approximately $2 million in contracts, when in fact the parts came from China. And similarly, in 2017, a federal judge ordered the owner of a Huntsville-based company to forfeit $4.4 forfeit $4 million and sentenced him to serve four years in prison for fraudulently supplying hundreds of thousands of Chinese-produced baseball caps and backpacks to the Army Recruiting Command in contravention of the BAA and the Barry Amendment. So those just kind of underscore how important <laughs> compliance is when it comes to federal domestic preference programs. You can go to the next slide. Sorry about that. <clears throat> So diving into uh, the Buy American Act, um, first providing an overview. Um, the Buy American Act favors the purchase of domestic end products and the use of domestic construction materials on certain federal contracts performed in the US. Um, but in effect, even though the language that's used uh, it is written like a prohibition by saying that foreign products are restricted, it really operates as a preference. Um, and the, the preference is implemented through the use of a price evaluation adjustment. Um, so, so in effect, it's not truly a prohibition and it is possible that in uh, certain circumstances, the agency could end up um, purchasing and issuing the award to an offeror who's offering uh, foreign end products. Um, so the way that the price evaluation adjustment works depends on which agency is conducting the acquisition. Uh, for civilian agencies, if the lowest price offer is for foreign end products, then that low offer will be increased by 20% if the lowest domestic offer is a large business, or by 30% if the lowest domestic offer is a small business. If the foreign offer is still lower than the lowest price domestic offer, uh, even after the price adjustment, then the agency will make the award to the foreign offer. Uh, but for if it's a DOD acquisition, then the price preference 
uh, the price evaluation adjustment is even greater. It's 50% that would get added to the lower foreign offer. Um, and, and usually this is a pretty substantial increase, as you might assume, and this can usually be determinative, um, meaning that you know if, if you're going to have a 50% price increase, then you're going to be priced out and you're not going to be able to um, beat the domestic end product offer. Um, I want to point out that the price adjustment that's made is only for purposes of the price evaluation and determining the awardee. Um, but for the actual award, the award will actually be made at the proposed price and not the increased evaluation price. So when does BAA apply? Um, it applies to all federal prime supply and construction contracts uh, with an estimated value above the micro purchase threshold unless the Trade Agreements Act applies. So first of all, the BAA does not apply to purely service contracts, um, only supply and construction contracts. And then you have to pay attention to the contract value, um, the estimated contract value. So first, BAA doesn't kick into the very small contract awards um, under the micro-purchase threshold, which currently is $10,000 sorry, ten thousand dollars in most circumstances. Um, and then it also, once the TAA kicks in, which is around $187,000 for supply contracts, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, um, then, then TAA kicks in and the Buy American Act restrictions would no longer apply if TAA applies, because it's a, an important point is that both TAA and BAA do not apply. It would be one or the other. Um, Buy American Act, applies to certain types of contracts that are not covered by TAA. So even for contracts that are above the TAA threshold, um, if, if the type of contract is a certain type, like ones for arms, ammunition, war materials, or purchases indispensable for national security or national defense, for certain sole source acquisitions or a small business set aside, um, those are exceptions to TAA where TAA won't apply in which case the Buy American Act requirements kick back in. Um, so you can see it can be pretty confusing to figure out the, uh, the value aspect, the type of contract that's involved here. Um, it can be a complex determination of whether BAA or TAA should apply. And then also um, BAA generally applies only to contracts for products to be used or construction to be performed in the US. It doesn't apply to uh, contracts to be performed outside the U.S., except that um, under the DOD's Balance of Payments program, um, that program extends BAA restrictions to DOD procurements for supplies or construction that take place outside the U.S. So it's important to be aware that even though the general principle for BAA is that it doesn't apply outside for services or performance outside the US, that's not the case if it's a DOD procurement that you're dealing with. So now that we've talked about the uh, overview and applicability of BAA, uh, I want to dive into the country of origin test, how you determine whether a product is a domestic end product or not. So there, there are two separate tests depending on um, whether you're dealing with a manufactured or non-manufactured product. So first, if it's a non-manufactured product, then to qualify as a domestic end product, it must be mined or produced in the U.S. For manu manufactured products, it's a two-part test to determine whether they qualify as a domestic end product. First, the item must be manufactured in the U.S. And second, the cost of the components of the end product uh, mine produced or manufactured in the U.S. must exceed 55% of the cost of all of the end product components. Now, if the end product uh, is wholly or predominantly made of iron or steel, which would be more than 50% in iron or steel product, then there's a thresh separate threshold for those products. And in that case, uh, the 
cost of components test goes all the way up to 95%. So 95% of those components of those products um, must be from US made components. Um, so generally for commercially available off the shelf items, uh, the component test doesn't apply to those items. Um, instead, the COTS items need only be manufactured in the US. And the FAR defines commercially available uh, off the shelf items as any items of supply, including construction material, that's a commercial item that's sold in substantial quantities in the commercial marketplace and offered to the government without modification in the same form in which it's sold in the commercial marketplace. So an important exception to the exception, of course, is um, under the, this new treatment for products that are consisting wholly or predominantly of iron and steel, uh, the commercially available off the shelf exception doesn't apply to those items. So diving in a little bit more to this two-part test for determining the country of origin. First, we need to define what it means to be manufactured. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a clear rule for that, but GAO has provided some guidance in its bid protest decisions. Um, and this is Generally, that manufacture is the operation whereby the identity and character is established and fixed as to its current and future use. And it's the completion of the article in the form required for use by the government. Uh, it's a less stringent test than that used by TAA, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but it doesn't need to involve substantial or fundamental change to the physical character of the item. Assembly may be sufficient to constitute manufacturing, but mere packaging of a product that's already been assembled is not enough. Um, for instance, assembly of a multifunction fax, printer, scanner, copier, and all of its parts has found to be sufficient. However, if it's just a limited assembly that doesn't change the essential nature of the product, that's likely to be insufficient. Um, for example, GAO has found that the disassembly, substitution of parts in terms of a removal of a circuit board and replacement of memory chips, and then reassembly in the U.S. of an otherwise Japanese-made commercial fax machine did not change its essential function and nature of the fax machine, and therefore it wasn't considered to be manufactured in the U.S. Um, and similarly, GAO has held that refurbishing in the U.S. of a cargo container from China which just consisted of replacing the floors and panels and fixing dents and repainting uh, didn't count as manufacture in the US because it didn't change the essential nature of the containers. They still stayed as containers. So this it, it's a really fact intensive inquiry that needs to be applied on a case by case basis. For the second part of the country of origin test under BAA is the component test. And the cost of the domestic components must exceed 55% of the total component cost, or 95%, as we mentioned, for iron and steel components. A component is defined as an article, material, or supply directly incorporated into an end product or construction material. I and mean, then it's important to consider that how your how your end product is made up um, and taking into account the end product versus the components for that product versus subcomponents. Um, and keep in mind that cost is measured at the component level and not the subcomponent level. Um, so for example, in one GAO case where the agency was procuring lock sets, GAO viewed Korean fabricated steel as the relevant component of the end product, even though the steel was originally purchased in the US. It was subsequently shipped to Korea for fabrication and then returned to the U.S. for manufacture of the end item lock sets. Um, but the U.S. steel was not directly used in the end item. Instead, the steel required fabrication in Korea for 
uh, in order for the, the manufacture of the end items. So the U.S. steel cost was, uh, the U.S. steel was considered to be a subcomponent, and the cost of that steel was therefore relevant because uh, the because the um, component cost is what matters here. So for calculating the component cost, if the components are purchased, then the cost is based on the acquisition cost, which would include any transportation costs and applicable duties. Um, if the components are manufacturers, then it would include all costs associated with the manufacturer of the components, not including additional manufacturer to put together the end product. Um, but including transportation and overhead without profit. It's also important to note that components that have an unknown origin will be presumed to be foreign. So if you can't document that it's domestic, then it's going to be presumed to be a foreign component. So moving on, I want to touch on the exceptions to BAA. Um, so there are certain circumstances where the agency may acquire foreign end products if a specified exception applies. One of these would be commercial IT acquisitions, uh, <clears throat> which may seem like a very helpful exception, um, but commercial IT products are often procured through federal supply schedules. And GSA has taken the position that all federal supply schedules are subject to TAA, not BAA. So uh, while there's an exception for commercial item, uh, commercial IT acquisitions under BAA, that's not the case for TAA. It doesn't have a similar exception. Uh, so this commercial IT acquisition exception may be helpful if you're dealing with a small standalone contract for commercial IT uh, that isn't you know, a federal supply schedule contract and that falls above the micro-purchase threshold but below the TAA threshold, uh, then this, this exception could still be useful to you. There, there is an exception based on unreasonable cost of the domestic end product, which we talked about. Uh, that would be through the price preference that would be applied. So if the domestic offer is not the low offer, reasonableness is based on that price preference and whether the domestic offer exceeds the low foreign offer, even after adjustment to the foreign offer's price of either 20% or 30%, depending on uh, the domestic offer size as a large or small business. Next, there's also an exception based on non-availability of domestic end products or components. Uh, this would be if items are not mined, produced, or manufactured in the US in sufficient and reasonably available quantities and not of satisfactory quality. There's two ways that this exception can come into play. It can come into play through class determinations of non-availability. Uh, these are listed out, items that fall under these class determinations are listed out in the FAR in this provision here. So um, you can go check those out if you are wondering whether your product falls into that. It can also come by through individual determinations made by the agency. Um, with respect to, it can be done for a particular contract. So for instance, if the acquisition is done through full and open competition and properly synopsized, and the agency doesn't get any offers of domestic end products, then the agency can use this non-availability -availabil exception without any written determination of non-availability. So um, that th this one can be useful when there don't end up being any domestic end products. And that can be a situation where um, you know, if you have a foreign end product, you can still present that offer as long as you're notifying the agency that your offer consists of uh, foreign end products. The next exception is based on public interest. The head of the agency may determine that domestic preference is inconsistent with the public interest. Um, this exception applies when the agency has an agreement with a foreign country that provides a blanket exception to BAA. Uh, the Department of Defense uses this public interest exception to waive BAA for countries that have entered a reciprocal procurement memorandum of understanding with the U.S. And these uh, memoranda cover defense goods that are excluded from trade agreements that cover government procurement. So these would be listed as the qualifying country end products. 
and and um, those would also be treated as domestic end products. And then finally, there's an exception for products for commissary resale. This exception applies to items purchased by the contracting agency for resale at military bases. So I'm going to turn it back over to Anna to talk about some of the recent changes that we've seen. Okay, so as I mentioned briefly earlier, President Trump made an executive order in July 2019 titled Maximizing Use of American-Made Goods, Products, and Materials. Um, and this executive order directed the FAR Council to consider proposing various amendments to the FAR, and the FAR Council ended up implementing these amendments, which had the effect of increasing the domestic content requirement to 55% for most products and to 95% for products consisting wholly or predominantly of iron or steel, as uh, Jackie mentioned earlier, and removing the commercially available off-the-shelf exception for products consisting wholly or predominantly of iron or steel, and increasing price preferences for domestic products to 20% for large businesses and 30% for small businesses. Um, this is a substantial increase from the prior price preferences, which were previously 6% for large businesses and 12% for small businesses. And uh, this final rule applies to solicitations issued on or after February 22nd, 2021. And Biden's executive order that I'll be talking about in the next couple of slides doesn't invalidate this final rule, but it remains to be seen whether or not these changes from the Trump administration will be kept as is or further modified as a result of the Biden administration's executive order. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this slide is just kind of an overview of Biden's January 2021 executive order titled Ensuring the Future is Made in All of America by All of America's Workers. Uh, this refers broadly to all statutes, regulations, rules, executive orders, et cetera, that relate to federal domestic preference laws generally. It just kind of generally expresses the Biden administration's policy that the U.S. government should maximize the use of domestic products and services and should, quote, whenever possible, procure goods, products, materials, and services from sources that will help American businesses compete in strategic industries and help America's workers thrive. So that's kind of just a general policy that the Biden administration is going for with this executive order and moving forward. Okay. Next slide. All right, so what are the key implications for government contractors coming from this executive order? First off, uh, the EO strengthens BAA domestic content requirements by directing the FAR Council within 180 days to consider proposing amendments to the FAR provisions that will replace the component test with a value added test. Um, this value added test would measure domestic content by the value added to the product through US based production or US job supporting activity. However, the executive order doesn't really explain how much or how such value would be calculated. Um, next, it would increase the numerical threshold for domestic content requirements for end products and construction materials and increase price preferences for domestic end products and domestic construction materials. But notably, the order does not specify specific numbers for domestic content requirements or domestic price preferences. So like I mentioned before, it's kind of unclear how much the percentages will increase given the implementation of Trump's, the Trump administration's July 2019 executive order. Um, and then it also directs the FAR Council to review any existing constraints on the extension of Made in America laws to IT commercial items that Jackie was talking about before. Um, so the executive order also requests the FAR Council to develop recommendations to lift any current constraints on the extension of Made in America laws to IT commercial items to further the executive order's policy. So it remains to be seen on what the FAR Council will recommend and how this will play out specifically with IT commercial items. Next slide. All right. So there's also an implication that it increases scrutiny of requests for waivers of Made in America laws. So it recommends that the OMB establish a Made in America office with a Made in America director. And before agencies can grant a waiver, 
the agency is required to describe the proposed waiver and provide a detailed justification to the Made in America director. So they have to justify why they're making use of goods, products, or materials that have not been mined, produced, or manufactured in the U.S. And then GSA is to develop a public website with information on any proposed waivers and whether or not they're granted. So this public website on waivers is proposed you know, in an effort to increase transparency in federal procurement, but it will also seemingly bring along with it potential public scrutiny with competitors now able to see proposed waivers and their corresponding justification. So it seems that the administration wants to limit the use of waivers, so that is important to keep in mind moving forward. Okay, next slide. All right. And finally, this executive order is to assist contractors with supplier scouting by directing agencies to identify suppliers of American-made products. And agencies are to partner with the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership to conduct supplier scouting. So these supplier scouting requirements are being implemented to help connect new businesses to federal contracting by requiring agencies to scout for American companies including small and medium-sized companies that are able to produce goods, products, and materials in the U.S. that meet federal procurement needs. And finally, it imposes agency reporting requirements that direct agencies to, within 180 days, detail their implementation and compliance with Made in America laws, describe any waivers, and provide recommendations to further the EO's policy. So, if anything, these reporting requirements just further highlight the Biden administration's renewed emphasis on strengthening Buy America laws and seem to show that this emphasis is not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, Anna, I, I, I think it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of the executive order. Um, especially when it comes right on the heels of this final rule that already increases the thresholds that we're seeing for domestic content for uh, BAA to see whether the rule will result in even higher thresholds, which is a possibility, um, or, or changes to how the uh, test is going to be carried out at all, um, whether the component test will change. So that's um, potentially very large changes on the horizon um, when we've just had these big changes from the final rule in terms of um, you know, the 5% domestic content increase for most products, the new category for steel and iron products that require 95% domestic content of those components um, come from be US made, um, and the um, price preferences as well jumping up from six or 12% to 20 to 30%. Um, it, it, which is a pretty substantial change. And then the focus on the waivers as well is interesting. I think this is something that um, the government has been interested in trying to restrict for a while now um, and potentially having this public aspect of it. Um, the public scrutiny may be a good way to assist with that uh, where there will be more eyes on those de agency decisions to grant a waiver. So I do think that um, will result in the exceptions to BAA and waivers being granted less often because the agency knows that these are going to be um, reviewed with more scrutiny in the government and by the public at large as well. Um, so it, the, we should see in the next six months or so the recommendations that come out of this that will be in a, a should be issued through a proposed rule with an opportunity for comment, public comment on them. Um, so, you know, everybody should keep their eyes out for when that proposed rule comes out so that you can understand what the uh, potential changes will be and potentially comment on it before any final rule goes into effect, which likely will still be a ways down the road, given that uh, it, it took a, a number of years for any final rule to come out of uh, Trump's number of executive orders on Made in America laws. So next, we wanted to briefly touch on the Trade Agreements Act, just to provide a, a little um, information about how TAA is differentiated from BAA. Uh, so the TAA is the implementation of 
are free trade agreements. Free trade agreements guarantee non-discrimination and government procurement among the signatory nations. And TAA implements those US trade agreements so that the designated country end products or services are treated as though they're made in the US for TAA covered procurements. Designated countries are ones covered by a free trade agreement with the US. Um, the World Trade Organization Government Procurement Agreement countries, which is the uh, largest <clears throat> free trade agreement that um, is covered by TAA uh, and has a couple dozen uh, country members that you can, they're all listed in the FAR so you can see um, who, who the countries are that are subject to the WTO GPA or that have a free trade agreement with US and therefore that would be covered as designated countries. It also covers some least developed countries and Caribbean basic countries. So these are all listed in, uh, in the FAR that you can check out as you're um, considering whether your products or your supplier's products are being provided by TAA compliant countries. And we just wanted to point out a couple of non-designated countries include China, India, and Turkey. So for TA, uh, TA's applicability, so how it works is it, it does, in comparison to BAA, it does establish a prohibition and not a preference. Um, it prohibits end products or services from non-designated countries. Uh, as an offeror, you may still offer non-designated country products, but it must be disclosed in your certifications along with the offer when you do that. Um, and it's more likely that uh, doing so will render those products to be ineligible unless there's a basis for a waiver altogether. There's no price preference that would be applied that would allow the agency to um, choose an offer of foreign uh, or non-TA compliant products. Um, as we touched on, TAA effectively acts as a waiver of BAA because once the TAA threshold is reached, then TAA becomes the effective um, regulation rather in place of the BAA restrictions. TAA applies to federal acquisitions whose estimated value meets or exceeds uh, listed thresholds. And the applicable threshold varies by the agreement and the type of procurement. So unfortunately, it's not entirely clear. You have to go into the um, FAR and look at the different values that apply for each free trade agreement that covers the country where your products are coming from. Um, but the WTO GPA is the largest one that covers a large number of countries um, that threshold for when that one kicks in is at 182,000 for supplies or services. And for construction contracts, it's 7,008,000. Um, and these thresholds are updated every two years. The latest update was from January of 2020. So it's important that you're consistently checking um, every couple of years that you're staying on top of the uh, thresholds increasing so that you're aware of when TA will kick in. Um, I also want to note that the estimated, it's based on the estimated value of the contract as a whole, um, including the option periods. So not just looking at the value of a base period. So the rule of origin for uh, products that are covered by TAA differs from the country of origin test under BAA. Um, and so, so TAA does apply to service contracts as well as supplies and construction um, services aren't covered by BAA. So for the test for service contracts uh, is the country in which the firm providing the services is established. This is uh, not the place where the service is performed or provided. You need to look at where the firm is established. And GA is held that established means where it's incorporated or headquartered. So again, for if you're dealing with a services contract, you're not looking at where the uh, services are being performed, but where the uh, offeror is incorporated or headquartered. For products, 
the <clears throat> test is either the country where the article or product is wholly grown, produced, or manufactured, or if the article consists of materials from multiple countries, then it will be the country where the article has been substantially transformed into a new and different article of commerce with name, character, or use distinct from that of the article or articles from which it was transformed. This is a very fact-specific analysis based on the totality of the circumstances. Uh, and the determinant of the issue really is the extent of operations performed and whether the parts lose their identity and become an integral part of the new article through the processing that's being done um, in a given country. The key factors that will be looked at are the extent of processing within a, a country, um, whether processing results in a new name, character, and use, the resources that are expended on product design and development, the skill level required in the manufacturing process, and key programming or customization that defines the product and its functionality. It's really under the TAA's test, it's more about the uh, processing of the articles, whereas under BAA, the BAA's test focuses more on um, where the components come from and the value of those components. So here we, have uh, a little chart where we are identifying the key differences between BAA and TAA. Um, first, the effect, which we've talked about, uh, for BAA, it's a preference, whereas under TAA, it's a prohibition. There's no price adjustment made for evaluation purposes. For applicability, in terms of the contract types, BAA will only apply to prime contracts for supplies or construction, whereas TAA applies to contracts for supplies, construction, or services. In terms of contract value, BAA applies above the micro-purchase threshold unless TAA applies, and TAA kicks in uh, at the applicable threshold for the free trade agreement that's provided in the FAR. Um, for WTO GPA, currently 187,000 for supplies or um, around 7 million for construction contracts. The country of origin test for BAA is this two-part test. It has to be manufactured in the U.S. and at least 55% of the cost of all components must come from domestic components or at least 95% for uh, predominantly steel and iron products versus TAA, the focus is uh, whether the product was substantially transformed in the US or in another country to reach its end product form and use. And then in terms of the exceptions and waivers, there's some overlap here, um, but there, there are differences in, in when each of them uh, applies or has exceptions. Um, notably, one of the very important ones under TAA is that TAA does not apply to small business set-asides. Um, instead, if it's a small business set-aside, TAA won't apply even if it's above that dollar threshold, it's gonna go back and the BAA requirements will apply instead. TAA also doesn't apply to um, acquisitions of arms, ammunition, war materials, or purchases indispensable for national security or national defense, certain sole source acquisitions, uh, acquisitions for end products for resale, acquisitions from the federal prison industries and ability one, uh, or for certain services, which varies by the trade agreement. That's at issue, um, but generally these may cover transportation, utilities, uh, R&D or services supporting military services overseas. So again, you would need to go into the FAR uh, to see did what whether your services contract is the type of services for which TAA doesn't apply. Um, and then under TAA, the agency has discretion to grant waivers based on non-availability, like with BAA, if there are no offers for domestic end products, then a, a offer for foreign end products can be accepted. Um, and then also based on uh, DOD has a national interest uh, waiver that they can apply. And then uh, again, importantly, BA applies where TA does not apply because of 
an exception. They don't both apply, but if TA doesn't apply, then you can't just assume that there are no domestic sourcing restrictions. You need to consider whether then BAA would apply. Now we're going to talk about the compliance tips a little bit. I'm handing it back over to Anna to talk about this. Okay, so the first compliance tip we have for you is to get clarity on the applicability of BAA and TAA. Um, make sure that you review your solicitations and contracts and that you understand which domestic sourcing requirements apply. But do not assume that BAA and TAA do not apply if the contract clause is omitted because courts hold that if a contract or requirement is required by law, it will be read into the contract. So if it's not there, don't assume that it just does not apply. Um, and agencies can make mistakes and they can include both BAA and TAA clauses. So if you're not sure which applies, be sure to raise the questions with the agency or as a supplier with the prime contractor. Um, so in, pay attention to requests for information from the agency. Make sure to provide any information that you have to the agency. Um, the agency has no obligation Sorry, there's a siren outside. I don't know if you can hear that, but <laughs> the agency has no obligation to conduct clarifications to get any inform any missing information. This obligation is on the offeror to show that your projects your products are compliant. So make sure that you're confident in the requirements before you submit your proposal and your certifications. Okay, next slide. All right, and the key here is to understand that unless you specifically list the products that are not compliant, you're certifying that all products are compliant. So you have to make sure that your certification is accurate. Um, review the products that you're offering on schedule contracts and make sure that they remain compliant. So keep in mind that certifications are ongoing. If you have a change with some of your sources, notify the government prior to making that change to allow them to determine how they want to proceed. Um, and then you can get clarity on country of origin. You can seek country of origin determinations from customs. They issue advisory rulings that are non-binding and final determinations on country of origin that are binding. And if you don't agree with a final determination, you can seek judicial review with the Court of International Trade. So if you're unsure, just be sure to cover your bases and um, you can seek a country of origin determination if that would be helpful for you. Okay, so some compliance tips for prime and sub relationships. Um, it, it's very important to keep in mind that the BAA and TAA requirements and the FAR clauses are not mandatory flow downs. Um, so they will not automatically be read into any subcontracts. The uh, prime contractor needs to determine if a flow down is necessary and make sure to include any BAA or TAA clauses and restrictions in the subcontract. Uh, because otherwise the uh, subcontractor is not going to be subject to those domestic um, sourcing restrictions. If you don't include, include those clauses as a prime contractor in your subcontract, uh, the subcontractor won't otherwise be subject to those restrictions, but the prime contractor, prime contractor will remain ultimately responsible for compliance. So you're going to be on the hook uh, with respect to the government for providing domestic end products without requiring the same restrictions and sourcing from your subcontractors. So you need to pay attention to what is in your prime contract and make sure that you're passing those restrictions down to your appropriate suppliers. When a flow down is necessary, the prime contractor should make sure to obtain a certificate of compliance from its subcontractor so that the uh, so so that it's a bit of a risk shifting step to make sure that you're getting that certification from your subcontractor saying that their products that they're supplying are in compliance with the domestic sourcing restrictions that you've passed down, whether BAA or TAA, through the subcontract. That way, the prime contractor can rely on that certification from its subcontractor. The subcontractor should all, the sub, subcontract, sorry about that, should also include appropriate risk shifting provisions 
By that, we mean that it should include an indemnification provision for uh, non-compliant products or for fault certifications so that uh, the subcontractor will be obligated to indemnify the prime contractor for any damages or losses it incurs as a result of the subcontractor's products not being considered domestic end products at the end of the day. So that if the prime contractor is subject to any liability from the government, because products that it ended up delivering ended up being foreign end products instead of domestic end products, that the prime can pass that liability down or seek indemnification from its subcontractor. But we often see the question about how far a prime needs to go in investigating a subcontractor's compliance. Um, and generally the case on this holds that as long as the prime contractor gets that certification of compliance from its subcontractor, that is generally sufficient uh, as long as it's an ongoing certification. Um, so, so that's why, again, it's very important to get those certifications from your suppliers uh, that they're complying with the restrictions and that they're providing domestic end products or notifying the prime contractor when they're providing foreign end products uh, so that the prime contractor can then rely on that certification rather than having to do its own investigation into uh, the subcontractor's manufacturing process, for instance. There's no need to go into a plant and um, you know, see how things are made and understand all of the details of the calculations of cost if you're just a, a reseller. Um, to um, You don't have to go through all of those additional investi investigation steps. However, if the prime contractor has any reason to doubt the certification, if there are clear red flags, um, if a product that's being passed on has packaging that has made in China stamped on it, for instance, um, or for any other reasons that a prime contractor may be aware of to question the certification and think that they're um, actually providing foreign end products rather than domestic end products, then you can't just rely on the uh, certification from the subcontractor anymore. The prime contractor would have a duty to do additional investigation um, and to notify the government if it finds that it's actually providing foreign end products when it's certified that uh, it would be providing domestic end products. Okay, next slide. It's also important for all contractors to develop internal policies and procedures for how they're going to deal with BAA and TAA requirements um, and how they're going to ensure compliance. For instance, Contractors should think about who in the firm will be responsible for ensuring that compliance with any BA or TA requirements are met, uh, for determining what certification protocols must be followed in the first place, what certifications are expected from subcontractors or suppliers. If you have a general um, manager who's in, in charge of managing subcontractors, will that person be the one who will be discussing any certifications with them or will you have a somebody in charge of uh, domestic sourcing restrictions generally who will be handling these aspects? And how will you be monitoring your subcontractor or supplier compliance? You should also train employees to identify which laws apply and um, what the relevant exceptions, waivers, and tests are, um, and understanding the differences between the different laws. You should consider the procuring agency and where the products or services will be used and the value of the procurement, um, because again, as we've talked about, uh, whether the BA or TA laws apply depends on the all of these different aspects whether it's a dod procurement or a civilian one and whether it's services or supplies and whether you've triggered that tea threshold or not for instance um, and you should also train employees on identifying end products and components versus subcomponents and where they're manufactured or where they may be substantially transformed and cost um, so that you have an understanding of how you're determining whether the end products are domestic or foreign. 
It's also important to maintain accurate records of the origin of the components and the end products. Uh, whether you're the prime contractor or the subcontractor, you need to have that chain of where the products are coming from and where they're manufactured and keep the documentation and keep those records on hand in case there's an investigation down the road um, so that you can keep track of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all. That's nope, that's <laughs> that's what we have. I'm trying to take a look at the questions here. Um, you know, one question we have says, what does Biden's EO mean when it says made in all of America? Uh, and what does all of America mean? I think that's just the uh, wording that's used in the executive order. Um, just trying to get the point across that it's covering all of the different what are termed to be made in America laws that would cover the Buy American Act and the Trade Agreements Act as well as, uh, as Anna touched on earlier, the Barry Amendment and Buy America, um, all of the different laws that we have that are uh, domestic, um, <clears throat> domestic sourcing restrictions. Um, sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty looking at the questions here. Um, so I, I see that we have a few of them. Some of them look to be very specific uh, in what they're asking, so we can dig into those a little bit later. Um, and if you have any questions, you may, of course, feel free to email us at our email addresses here, and we'll make sure to go through these and get back to you um, with our thoughts on this. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for attending. We appreciate you guys. Um, joining us for the presentation today. And again, please feel free to reach out to us if, if you have any questions on BA or TAA uh, or how they apply or any of the changes or the impacts of the changes based on the new final rule or the, um, uh, the executive order that came out recently. Thank you.